All right, in that case, let's get started. So thank you uh, one and all for joining today's edition of the Haskellers Meetup. Um, we have a very special guest today, my uh, friend and longtime coworker Dominic, whom I badgered for several months before he agreed to give this talk. Um, it's a talk less about Haskell than it is about um, formal logic, functional programming, and some interesting ways you can make use of both of these things uh, that I think for a lot of us are more hobbies um, than anything we use in our professional lives. But uh, today we have an example of something that was actually built to fulfill a real business need. Um, and I think this making this sort of link to the practical world is always uh, something that gives me joy. So uh, without further ado, give it up for Dominic. Well, thanks for the introduction, Kazim. Um, he kind of crashed like most of my introduction uh, <laughs> because he, he did it for me. So I'll, I'll just get started. He also already prefixed a bunch of things that I wanted to mention before I get into the actual talk. Um, <clears throat> There is multiple reasons why there is no Haskell involved. Uh, reason one is um, that the code, honestly, is not that interesting. Once you figure it out, the theoretical bits and pieces, it, it's mostly just typing out code. Um, secondly, it's written in Scala, which I thought would be slightly inappropriate for a Haskell meetup. So uh, that's the second reason. The, the way this kind of came to be is, um, and why he had to badger me for a couple of months before I ended up giving this talk is this is actually my master's thesis project. Um, so I wanted to actually hand in my thesis before giving the talk um, and see that I actually passed because again, that would have been fairly embarrassing if that would have, wouldn't have been the case. Uh, for those of you that know a lot about formal logic already and have uh, training on that area of expertise, I'll have to slightly disappoint you because I'll be playing fairly fast and loose uh, about with the mathematical rigor that we will go into. Uh, reason for this is mostly for the sake of expediency. Uh, yeah, questions, right. Uh, give me a sec. I actually need to make sure I can see the slides as well. Uh, questions are welcome at any time. I might, however, defer answers that would take a long time. You can grab me afterwards if, if anything in particular interests you. So before we get into the actual formal logic bit, I think it's important to understand where, where we are coming from with this project idea in the first place. And uh, both Cosim and I, we work for a company called Rivero. We make products for credit cards specifically for disputes. So if somebody uh, steals your credit card data and commits fraud, or you order something, a pair of shoes, but only one arrives, um, or any such things, then you can open up a credit card dispute and get your money back. The problem with that is that historically you had to go to a website of whoever issues your credit card, download the PDF form, fill that in, send that by snail mail, and that process would go back and forth for a really long time, and it was really annoying. So, you know, why not make this digital? And the idea of making this digital kind of comes from the fact that whenever you have a PDF form, you can do a wizard or like some sort of series of masks to fill in that information. If you can do that, you can offer a chatbot-like interface that is much more amenable to your end users rather than, you know, a nitty-gritty set of forms. And that does get us to the idea of that project, uh, which is dialogues. So again, kind of chatbot-like interface where when you build these dialogues, which you will do as uh, graphs, then you define essentially a sequence of questions and answers where each answer puts in a piece of information in some sort of structural data. In our case, JSON. But fundamentally, in, in the theory we built, can be any sort of finite tree. Um, from the software engineering point of view, one of the things you want there, of course, is being able to infer the structure of that data at the end of your, of your graph so that then you can process that data in your backend code. And so that gets us 
to that conversation system. And of course, like each path in these graphs, you can render as a dialogue, as a chatbot. Uh, I want to put a slight caveat here, namely that even though I say chatbot a lot, this has zero machine learning, there is no NLP, none of this, right? This is not that. Uh, so here you can actually see what this looks like. And so each of these message bubbles here, they basically correspond to a node in the graph. And then you have question nodes that have like this reply button, and then you get to choose. So in this case, this is just a single choice question. Of course, there's different question types you can, you can introduce. Uh, by the way, this is just our demo app. Uh, our customers that use this, they do their own front end, but it's just an API. So you can do whatever you want. And for this project, there is basically th three different stakeholders, you could say. And one of them is our business people. And that is the way they should work with this is with a graph editor, right? They should essentially have the equivalent of an IDE uh, so that they don't have to bother us, so that don't we, we don't have to hard code these dialogues all the time because these get very, very large. Like the, our, our current ones, they have thousands of nodes. So this would not lead to very maintainable code. And of course, this should support different node types for different questions, single choice, multiple choice, um, different data types like dates, free text numbers, and whatever else you, your heart desires. Uh, secondary to questions, there are also computational nodes because sometimes you might want to fetch data from an API and put it into structured data to enrich it and be able to consume later on. Um, from, from a system point of view, these two node types are not really different because, again, it, the only difference is whether the data is supplied by a human or by the computer. The practical consideration there is one of time gap, right? Like, your computer generally is much faster with answering questions than a human is. Another feature that actually has to be supported, and I can actually show this, you can actually see it here, is templating. So sometimes you have data in your structured in your structure that you want to insert into text. And the whole point of my master thesis is then, how do you make this not crash? How do you make this correct? And the motivation behind that is that we as backend engineers, we don't want to support the business people constantly, right? There are certain classes of errors that we as, as programmers are intimately familiar with, uh, whether it's our compilers yelling at us about type errors or you know, non-exhaustive matches or all these kinds of things. And it turns out that they have corresponding properties in these graphs, uh, so why not have something like a compiler that figures those things out for us? So here's just a quick couple of examples that you can kind of have a bit more idea what, what such graphs look like. Of course, these are very simple examples, but they get the point across. Uh, message node, question node, single choice. And then, of course, uh, this being a graph, you can then branch out uh, based on the answers that have been supplied. Slightly more complicated, because as it turns out, this branching does not have to happen based on data that has been supplied by the previous node. You can inspect arbitrary data that you have collected along the path. And then finally, these are the action nodes. Uh, so these are two API fetches, which is fairly straightforward. And then here we have case creation. Uh, this is for us internally. So at the end, when you have filled out your dialogue, then we create a case uh, internally that then is further handled by our customer agent to get your, your money back. When we formulated all these requirements, a fairly obvious question came up. Like, this sounds like somebody should already have built it. This, uh, this sounds fairly straightforward in many ways. And we looked at a bunch of different products or categories of systems to, to look if we can reuse parts of it or just buy it. Uh, we looked at game systems because, like, in games, if you have conversations with NPCs, uh, a bunch of similar things happen that decide where in the conversation you go. 
Uh, secondly, we looked at automation frameworks. Microsoft has one that lets you do Slack integrations uh, based on a graph that you can design in an editor, which is actually fairly nifty, except uh, one problem there is you can have a yes-no question and three outgoing edges labeled yes, and it'll just pick the leftmost one. Um, it, it does no correctness checking of any kind. We also actually looked at schema languages, specifically in our case for JSON schema. And this is a bit of a tangent that just is very close to my heart. Um, because initially, in initial drafts of JSON schema, um, the satisfiability question of that JSON schema, so whether there even is a JSON that fulfills that schema, was actually decidable. And by now, a bunch of drafts later, they ruined this. Uh, one way they did this is by choosing a regex dialect where the universality problem is not decidable. So this no longer works. You can actually find open source and research projects in the wild that have decision algorithms for previous uh, JSON schema drafts. And here is a, a question for you all, and you can give me your answers later. If you know any such system, and I just ended up rebuilding something that was really obvious, please let me know. So this brings us to the end of the introduction to just like get across why we are even building this and what we are building. And here is just a TLDR. And so dialogues are represented as tags, for now at least. Uh, structured data is collected along the paths of this graph and is inserted continuously in a finite tree, in our case specifically JSON. Nodes may produce no output. There is nothing interesting for just a plain message node to produce. Uh, so you can kind of consider them unitary. Um, there are nodes that have to be answered by users, nodes that are answered by computers. And finally, kind of the most important bit that only was apparent out of the slides, and I haven't explicitly mentioned, edges are labeled with predicates. And they signify whether an edge is admissible for traversal. These predicates consume the structured data that has been collected. So this project is pretty big, right? There is a ton of things you could spend a lot of time building. Whether this be the graph editor, um, to make this basically a full-fledged IDE with refactor support and what have you. Uh, the templating of text is actually trickier than you would think uh, to make sure that this all lines up properly. Uh, versioning and diffing of graphs here would be really interesting, right? Because we have user-provided question the lifetime of an execution of such a graph can be fairly lengthy. So one natural question there is, well, what do you do if you have a new version of that graph? Can you, can you just replace it at runtime? Is it backwards compatible? Is it not? Uh, there's questions there to answer. Automated test support, if you're developing this graph, would be kind of neat if you can just fast forward to any point in the graph with some nifty generators for that data. And uh, Code generation would make our life in the back end easier at the end of the day to consume that data. Now, what I actually built is just a very small part, namely a formal logic that lets you encode these correctness properties and kind of acts as a foundation for lots of features uh, for these other parts. And to go into this topic, I want to actually explain the correctness properties that, that uh, we have um, a bit more precisely. So firstly, high level, uh, there is quote unquote type checking. Um, this is mainly about whether the predicates on an edge are actually applicable to the structure at that point, right? Like it makes no sense to be able to address a field in the JSON that just doesn't exist yet or uh, comparing the number four to a string. Uh, exhaustivity, uh, when you have a set of outgoing edges at some node, they together collect a certain subset of your current structure, and you want to make sure that they cover that subset exhaustively, because else uh, you're going to have runtime errors. Uh, determinism, this is about that uh, edges, whenever you have multiple edges outgoing, there should always only be a single one that is traversable. Should, should never there should never be two edges traversable at the same point in the graph. And then because you can address any part of the structural data, uh, you have to care about what happened before in the path because else you can actually build that branches in your, in your graph uh, 
because you're contradicting previously established facts. So first we'll look at exhaustivity because it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, so this is just an example where we insert something at the property X, um, so kind of like JQ-like syntax, and we know that X will basically have the type A, B, or C. We have two outgoing edges, but what if X has the value C? It doesn't know where to go. It crashes bad times around. Similarly, for mutual exclusivity of, of, of uh, edges, so here the problem is we cover all the possible integers um, by just the fact that we have smaller than five here and bigger or equal than five here. So exhaustivity is A-OK. -okay, but if we get like an 11, both B or A would be possible to traverse. And then you have um, a problem that you don't know which edge to pick. And finally, uh, contradictions and triviality. So here, this is really, let's say we insert at x11, so we go to the left-hand side, so this is perfectly reachable. And now, at that point, we have established the fact that x is bigger than 10, else we would never have gotten to this node. So going left here is a contradiction, because these two properties are mutually exclusive. And the right-hand side property is strictly implied by the first edge we traversed, so therefore it's trivial, and that also is just nonsense. And now we get into the actual logic bit. So what we did is build an actual formal logic, specifically a dynamic logic, which is a, a family of logics. And we encoded our, our correctness properties as, as formulas that you can then run through a set solver and that will tell you whether, for instance, your edges are not exhaustive or you violated any of the other safety properties. Uh, before I actually dig a whole bunch into dynamic logic, um, because again, I don't know what your, what your background in, in logic is, I thought I'd do a quick primer uh, using propositional logic, which is one of the first ones you'll look at if you do any coursework uh, related to such topics. If you are interested in reading more, the Open Logic Project is awesome, um, and it's free, so just Google it, download the PDF, have a read. Um, formal logics, for the sake of this talk, uh, are quite often broken into blocks. Uh, the main two blocks are syntax and semantics. Um, and by syntax, we really just mean what is the grammar of the admissible formulas you can write, because that's the only ones you, you, we consider, and everything else is gibberish. Semantics, then, is basically about the interpretation of these formulas and how they relate to, to, to our notion of truth. So in predicate logic, uh, we have basically true and false, we have propositional variables, and we have the usual connectives of and, or, and not. Here is the actual grammar if you're interested, but the only thing that I really want to explain here is you have kind of atomic rules, like one and two here, that talk about uh, falsity and the propositional variables. You, get, you regain truth by just negating uh, this symbol. Then you have the definitions of your connectives, and then this is kind of a thing that is really just important if you do this very formally, because you know nothing else should be a formula to guarantee that everything else is just constructed by these other rules. Now, semantics is then about how do we assign truth to these constructed formulas, and you basically just follow the structures of your syntax, right? So here we have the rule for the false we, in, we established. Here we have propositional variables um, where this function here is just an assignment. You can, you can just specify that I am going to say that the variable A is true, B is false, whatever, the valuation function. And then you have the rules for your connectives. And they just act as you would know them from programming. Another thing you'll often come across when you dig into formal logic are models. And models are basically mathematical structures that, that um, enable the semantics and allow you to manipulate uh, this, this logic in a, in, a, in a mathematical rigorous way. And for propositional, for propositional uh, logic, really it's given by the assignment of variables. Uh, if you just do Boolean logic, so without uh, the, the variables, it's basically truth tables. And then satisfiability is basically the question, is there a model such that uh, my formula semantically evaluates to true? Uh, 
Now, we leave the realm of propositional logic and go into actual dynamic logic. Uh, if any one of you is familiar with modal logic, it resides in that family. Specifically, we have two constructs that kind of mirror the idea of exists and for all. Uh, they just can do much more. And dynamic logic consists of programs and those you can uh, construct up like a regex. So you have the same operators as you know from regex and what you're basically specifying is a set of possible executions that can happen. And then you have propositions that are checked after the execution of set projects, uh, programs that allow you to check the properties you want. So this is the actual syntax of, um, of dynamic logic and uh, it's a fair bit bigger of course than, than the propositional case but really the important bit kind of is here. Um, so this is how programs work. We have this box operator which is kind of like a for all and then we have a property that must hold after every possible execution. Uh, so this acts like a for all, uh, including vacuous truth. If there is no successful execution of the programs enumerated here, it'll evaluate to true. Um, then, as I said, you can compose them up. So this is the sequencing of two programs. There is the cleaning star, um, you know, just basically like regex. And this is what the models for dynamic logic look like. Uh, they are graphs. However, not to be confused with, with the graphs that we talked about earlier, uh, there are two different uh, sets of graphs. And here, as an example, the left-hand side, we have a formula that says in model M at the state x1, it must satisfy that we execute pi1 and then p must hold, or we execute pi2 and then q must hold. And this works a lot like the label transition systems that you might know from, again, regex. So here we can loop with pi1, p holds, so the left hand side of the conjunct holds. We start here, we go p2 and q holds, so the right hand side of the conjunct holds. This is true. So this, this formula is satisfiable because this model satisfies this formula. And then on the right hand side, a slightly more complicated uh, model. So here in m prime at state y2, it must satisfy that, and the way to read this is, for all executions of pi1, followed by pi1, followed by pi1, followed by pi1, for an arbitrary number of time, p must hold. And this is true here just because we have a self arrow, right? So you can do it zero times and it'll hold, or you can do it an arbitrary number of times and you'll be A okay. The second one here, this is a non deterministic union. So it, it just runs one of the two but it shouldn't matter which one, and then P or Q must hold, so we start at Y1, and then if we run Pi1, Q won't hold, but P will, and since this is an OR, we're good, and likewise if we go to Y3 through Pi2. So the idea then for JSON is you basically take this idea and you make the programs much more powerful, right? So normally in dynamic logic you just have this abstract um, atomic programs that you get to compose up. There is dialects where you're talking about programs that, that assign propositional variables. And you can model your programs however you want with some caveats. Um, so dynamic logic in general is uh, decidable. It's satisfiability problem because there is what's called the small model property which for the regular uh, dynamic logic just means because you have a, a finite set of uh, of individual properties and individual programs, you can build up uh, any possible graph and it is upper bounded, so there is a finite number of them and you can brute force it. So what we did then for the programs is we have to access data and we do this kind of like JQ-like, uh, there's a JQ-like syntax. We need to be able to create bindings, so extract data from the structure and then reuse it later we need to be able to uh, calculate new data. For instance, you might extract like a date from your JSON and you want to add a year. Um, and of course we need predicate functions because at the end of the day we still need to do some sort of true false, false uh, things. So this is what a formula looks like in, in that logic. And what we're doing here is uh, we have the root identifier which just stands for whatever JSON you're currently inspecting. 
you can navigate down with uh, foo and bar. They are, this dot operator is only applicable if the previous thing was an object. Uh, so you have to ensure this here. Um, this establishes two bindings, which you then can reuse. Dollar is dereferencing. And then you can check whether, whether this Boolean value here uh, has been true. So for instance, for this JSON, this formula would evaluate to true. Uh, if, for instance, here is a four, then it would not evaluate to true. If bar is missing, this bit here would crash, so it also is false. Funnily enough, uh, because of certain formal properties of this logic, if you pack this into the box operator and you leave out bar, it'll evaluate to true because there is no possible executions. And then uh, you have vacuous truth. Um, as a side note, as it turns out, because the particular dialect we designed is strictly deterministic, um, the box operator is entirely unnecessary because you always at most have one possible execution if there is a possible successful execution. Um, then to sum this up, the evaluation that we have, so like the data we consider, is just uniquely given by the chase we are looking at identified by the root identifier. And formulas are considered satisfiable if there exists at least one JSON such that the formula holds, right? So in effect, what we accidentally built is a schema language because what schemas do, for instance, JSON schema is it partitions all possible JSON into two classes, the ones that are valid, the other ones that aren't, the same with these formulas. And again, uh, just as a side note, I will actually skip the whole formal bit about this logic because it's a bunch of pages long. Uh, if you're interested, by the way, in this, uh, you can get the PDF of my thesis and read it later. So models in, in this logic then look fairly similar to what we saw before. So here we have a slightly different formula. Uh, we still do foo and bar, but now we force them to be ints because unlike equality, Order operations don't exist on all types. Um, and initial, we start at an initial state. We have yet no bindings. And these T and F sets are propositions we made that have evaluated to true or false, right? So first program snippet that we run, uh, we now have a binding, A equals 10, based on this JSON here. The second one runs. Now we have both bindings. The third one runs. We have three bindings. And because uh, this is a propositional function, something that returns a Boolean, it goes into that truth set. And then at the end, when you have reached the final state, you just have to resolve this Boolean formula that stands here in respect to this true and false uh, sets. Now, as I mentioned, now with a, a lot of, of um, extra words in between, the whole point of this project was to do correctness guarantees on these graphs. So now we have to deal with, we have a logic now, how do we encode these safety properties or correctness properties, I should say, um, into this logic? And we are not going to look at all examples, just two of them, uh, because lots of formulas. And the first one is about exhaustivity. So for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to say, we are going to consider the case where a node inserts something and all the edges that are outgoing from that node consider only that data, right? So phi here is whatever the node inserts. So a quick backing to the right picture, which is here. I didn't have space on the slide again, um, right? So this would be phi. This would be basically the formula of phi that stipulates that we, at x, we insert either a, b, or c. And then we have our edges. Each of them is labeled by a formula. So in the previous example, where I'm not going to scroll back to, it would be the two outgoing edges that say x is b or x is a. And then what we want to check is are these two formulas equivalent, right? Uh, the cool thing about the set procedures we built is that they're constructive. So if something is satisfiable, uh, the algorithm will actually give you an example of this. So what we do is we negate the whole thing. So to, for our safety property to actually pass, we want this to be unset. We want this to be not satisfiable. 
if it is satisfiable, there is a hole. There is a difference between what the node inserts and what you inspect. And because the algorithm is constructive, you'll get actually an example. It'll spit out a JSON that if you run through that node, there is no edge for it to traverse. Similarly, you, you can construct uh, for, mutual, for mutual exclusivity of edges where basically you just force that you're not looking at the same edge twice. And if that's the case, you take the conjunct of the formulas of both edges, and that must be the empty schema. Right? That this must be an unfulfillable formula, because if this is satisfiable, there exists a JSON that is accepted by both edges. And the way we built this set algorithm is actually with SMT solvers, uh, specifically set three. And what we did is fairly naive. Um, set three uh, supports a lot of different uh, theories. One of them is the theory of ADTs, of algebraic data types. So that means you can actually represent JSON trees in set three. And then based on the functions that we offer in the programs, uh, you need to basically have mirror images of those in, in set three. Uh, so for the arithmetic, for string functions, state functions, and all that. And then we take our formulas, we encode them into a SMT lib2, which is the Lisp dialect that, that, that set three uses. We encode this as a, as a problem for the SMT solver and let it calculate. And that works surprisingly well, except sometimes it runs for five seconds and sometimes for five minutes without rhyme or reason, uh, or at least I haven't figured it out yet. And, and because um, SAT solvers, or sorry, SMT solvers are constructive, we get the example back. Now, the thing is, if you just encode this, uh, SAT3 will also happily attempt to solve problems that are actually not decidable. And as it turns out, the logic as it was initially built is not decidable. And it took me a slightly embarrassing long time to figure this out, but basically we had just regular arithmetic on natural numbers and integers. And any of you who ever had to look at Gödel's incompleteness theorem proofs will know that that just does not work. So then we said, okay, fine. We are going to restrict multiplication with only one variable and a constant because that gets you from uh, an undecidable problem to a decidable problem, and then we should be good. However, we don't exactly have the clean star for program composition. We have iteration. So you actually say how many times you loop the program, but that, that number can be sourced from the JSON itself, for instance, list length. Uh, so if you want to iterate over a list. And then the problem is, again, you basically have two variables. You can rebuild multiplication uh, of, of two variables, and everything becomes undecidable again. So what we did to circumvent this problem is uh, there is a technique called k-bounded model checking, which you'll see in literature if you look at, at uh, systems of this kind. And what you do is you just set an arbitrary bound for this. Uh, because in terms of the, of the uh, set procedure, what you do is you unroll these loops. You just take the content of the loop, you sequence it one time, two times, zero times, 15 times, up to some arbitrary number. This gives you some number of problems, and then you run each one individually. And that then gives you back decidability because we eliminated all the things that made it undecidable in the first place. And this starts getting me to the end of my presentation because now here is my desperate cry for help. Uh, in case you know set three, um, I would be happy to chat later on uh, because I found out that the, the API bindings that it offers are very, very hard to work with. Uh, I think they were originally written in C++ and it's very noticeable. Um, uh, again, as I mentioned previously, the run times are a bit uh, sometimes high, sometimes low. And technically, you're supposed to be able to fix the necessary random seeds, but again, haven't figured it out. Uh, further, the encoding of our formulas to set three is extremely naive, right? We encode the entire JSON tree in there, which probably is too much and leads to truly horrendous uh, execution times. Um, so it would be cool if you could solve the structural part internally with a more specialized algorithm and then just dispatch like the arithmetic, uh, arithmetic problems and like sub problems to, to, to set three. Um, 
eventually business people came back to me when they, when they started actually designing such graphs and said, you know, it'd be kind of cool if we had uh, loops, which makes my graphs no longer DAX, which makes a lot of things very scary because the whole idea is that the, the, the structured data that you, that you build up during that graph is monot monotonically growing, right? You just insert something. So if you have loops, it becomes extremely messy. And as I already mentioned before, there is so many things that could be explored here. Uh, such a system can, of course, not only be used to build chatbots, but like for any sort of compliance process or whatever else verification you have in mind. Um, so yeah, if you have cool ideas, let me know. And that's that. Thanks. Thank you very much. But no, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, as usual, uh, we still have some time for questions. So, if there is anything anybody is curious about, um, um, uh, thank you for the talk. First of all, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I'm curious if you have any examples of like larger graphs and like the JSON. Just because I'm curious to kind of see what it looks like if it's not. I am honestly not exactly. I'm not sure whether I am allowed to show. I should have asked. Yeah. I should <laughs> in hindsight. Okay. But the, what I can tell you is, uh, some tooling that we built is uh, generating out with the dot language uh, these graphs. And if you generate an SVG, you'll be scrolling for a long time until you can actually read something. <laughs> Uh, so the thing is, the thesis, right, like the actual graph encodings are somewhat left out of the thesis. It's really about like the mathematical, the logical core. Uh, and what I do, however, show is like how you would construct these, uh, these correctness properties. So you mentioned there was a request for loops. I'm curious what kinds of dialogues are supposed to have loops in them? So quite often you have like a question that, that where you have to confirm that what you did is correct, right? Or um, where we take the data and we verify it. So in, in that case, we would like to send you back to like answer the questions again. Or uh, a sort of other loop you have, but that is somewhat solvable is let's say you have like 10 transactions, 10 credit card transactions that you're working with. And sometimes you have to answer a question for each uh, of these transaction individuals. Um, and yeah, as I said, the, the problem then becomes that if nodes insert data at a very specific point, um, and you can revisit this, in, in the meantime, the data has changed, and then you have to really think very carefully um, about, about whether your property still holds. It just makes everything much more complicated. Right, because when you, when you evaluate these graphs, essentially what you do is uh, all you have to store is that structured data because you just throw that at your graph and if the data is already there, it already has been answered, so you just follow through again, right? But then with loops, it becomes more awkward. You have to do more engineering there. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what I was wondering there, if it's just about confirming all the stuff, isn't, if instead of expressing this as, as loops, there would be a way to Yes, that's actually, so there is, let me check if it's visible. Probably not. No, it isn't. Oh, no, yeah, okay, wait, there, there is a slight, a slight bit of awkward choice of language here. <laughs> but we do have an undo function, and the way we handle this right now is notes are either marked as undoable or not, which has to do especially with computational nodes that do writes. Um, and then we just don't let you do that. But as what we do is from, from that JSON, we just strip the last thing. And then for all intents and purposes, you're back to where we, you were, right? So that, that does work, yes. Yeah, 
what extent do the um, uh, correctness criteria that you named come from uh, realistic scenarios, and to what extent is it more kind of resulting from the theoretical framework that you build up? So, the most, the, the one that uh, tends to bite you the most is. Exhaustivity, really. Uh, because, I mean, of course, this is an e extremely trivial example because it's essentially just an enum, right? But because you can write arbitrary properties on your edges, you can look at was this transaction an electronic one, and if yes, uh, is the amount bigger than 50, and was it done be before 2007? And then if you have all these edges there that should cover all the possible scenarios, this is super helpful. The thing is, like, right, you get the other ones for free. Because to, 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 build, exhaustivity, to build exhaustivity, you kind of need the set checking anyways. And once you have that, you just build the rest. And, uh, another question is, uh, with the satisfiability checking, you quite quickly jump to a set solver versus uh, set three, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and I I mean, I, I, I completely buy that to some extent you need set solvers anyway because you have the propositional formulas underlying your logic anyway. But for kind of pure, if, like if your problems arise purely from the modal logic part, from the dynamic logic, I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't know, I don't recall all the details about what, like what modal logic and what decidability uh, properties, but there are a lot of uh, fairly straightforward decidability uh, offset spiability for modal logic. Yep. So, um, is that like? Is there stuff that you can do there where kind of you do some of the satisfiability checking work before you jump to that stream? Yes, you could. Uh, so here's the thing, right? In classical dynamic logic, you are working with finite valuations because your formula only has so many variables. Uh, you you can always, and there is a proof of this. It's called a small model property. Uh, you can show that there is always a finite graph, a finite model, and there is an upper bound for the size of that model based on the length of the formula, so then you can brute force it. Now the problem is, in my case, our valuations here are not finite, <laughs> right? Because we have numbers. So uh, no matter how you then put this in code, all the small model properties just implode. So what you could do in, a, in kind of first step is say, I don't even care about this valuation. I just care about like, all the propositional variables. Right? And then if, if this is already not satisfiable, of course this won't be satisfiable either, but the other way around doesn't hold. So this would be a, a possible optimization, but for the sake of time, I didn't build any of that because it's actually fairly hard to find code for dynamic logic satisfiability algorithms. So. There is that. All right, then if there are no further questions, um, thank you very much for attending the talk. Uh, we have seats booked at the Ale House for after the event, and as it happens, we have just enough to fit everybody. So uh, those who wish to stay for beer, food, discussions, some of these or all of these are welcome to stay. Uh, for everybody who is leaving early, um, have a nice evening. Thank you for coming and see you next time.